Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our program today. You may know that Family Talk is a listener-supported program, and we remain on the air by your generosity, literally. If you can help us financially, we would certainly appreciate it. God's blessings to you all. That's right, Dr. Dobson. And friend, thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825. Today on Family Talk. Are you recently married? Do you know someone who is engaged? If so, we encourage you to listen to this edition of Family Talk or pass it along to a young couple in your life because it centers around the changes that come after saying, I do, and how young women specifically can honor God in their relationships. Hello, everyone. I'm Roger Marsh with your host, as always, best-selling author and child psychologist, Dr. James Dobson. Today on Family Talk, you're going to hear a classic conversation Dr. Dobson had with author and speaker Kay Coles James. They will explain the concept of being one with a person forever in marriage and why remaining pure for your spouse is so important. Now, before we get started, let me tell you more about today's guest. She's the current president of the Heritage Foundation, which actively promotes conservative public policies and traditional American values. She's also founder of the Gloucester Institute that educates and supports young African-American college students. Kay served President George H.W. Bush as Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services and also worked for former Virginia Governor George Allen as the state's Secretary of Health and Human Resources. In the early 2000s, she served President George W. Bush as Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, overseeing 1.8 million government employees. All of her jobs have dealt heavily with the family, a passion that Dr. Dobson also avidly shares. Let's begin their interview now on this edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Kay is so accomplished in so many ways. And then, of course, uh, you would put high on a list of credentials being a wife to Charles and a mother to three. I would put it as the highest yeah. on the list. That's always been what you've cared about Absolutely. Most. And for a woman that's accomplished this much, Kay, uh, how do you explain that? All that says is I can't keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that means. Not so. Not so. <laughs> no, I, I tell you... Um, being a wife and a mom is the highest, highest calling I have, mm-hmm. and and um, I, I just am privileged to be married to one of the most incredible men. And in the times that we live in, no, he's Jim, a neat guy. I, I, truly, I, I took the time to call him from the airport this morning, just to just to let him know how much I love him and how much I I appreciate his being willing to let our lives be so open and yeah. to be so vulnerable so that uh, we could share what God had taught us. In, in I, I was surprised that your daughter, Busy, allowed you to be <laughs> quite that open because she got married not long ago. And... She did. And, you know, I believe that everything that's ever happened to me has been a family calling. And, and our kids have known that from the very beginning. They've been involved in everything that Charles and I've ever done as a couple. And so there have been some special, uh, uh, you know, things that they've had to go through as the kids of. Yeah. And a part of that is having uh, your life dropped into one of mom's speeches every now and then, or being the son and being trotted out and saying, yeah. won't one of you people marry this guy? You know? <laughs> so uh, it's not been easy being a child of Charles and Kay. Well, this book uh, it has a wonderful title and great content. It's called what I wish I'd have known before I got married, and the <laughs> subtitle up at the top is uh, Keeping It Real, Kay Coles James. That uh, that title really does say it all, doesn't it, uh, Kay? You are trying to tell people right. uh, what do uh, you wish that somebody had told you. Well, there is a, a an entity in the black community called Sister Girlfriend. Yeah. She's part sister, part friend, but uh, it's she's characterized by being a straight talking, telling it like it is, no holes barred. She'll yeah. go where other people are hesitant to go, and uh, I I wanted to write the book from that perspective. Now let me get it straight, sister girlfriend. You got to say it with sort of an S- ethnic S- accent. Sister girlfriend. No, I can't go. do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Work on it a little while, yeah. but sister girlfriend. And and it's hyphenated. Yes, yeah. absolutely. 
And the essence of it is telling it straight. Keeping it real, telling it like it is, because when you're about to get married, you need somebody who will get in your face and ask you some tough questions and make you think through some difficult issues and also to, to get your eyes wide open about the possibilities. And now I'm not sure that was always the case with Christian marriages, because we assumed that we were protected from many of the things that happened in the world. But quite frankly, the data tells us otherwise today, Jim, as you well know, uh, I was surprised at the high divorce rate. I was shocked as I went to women's conferences and I heard that they were struggling in their marriages with husbands who were dealing with pornography, that they were struck. Now, these are Christian. I mean, yeah. saved marriage. Yeah. People where both parties love God. God are struggling with these difficult yeah. issues. And so uh, they uh, encouraged me uh, over and over again to, uh, to uh, answer and address some of those very specific issues. And then when my daughter mm. came home uh, with a young man and we could see it coming, we knew uh, mm. an engagement was about to happen. Um, you know, I began to go through, oh, my word, does she know this? Has she thought about that? And, and I began to collect information uh, that I think every mother would want their daughter to think through before getting married. And this book is really both for those engaged and not yet married and those that are newly married. Absolutely, uh, because there are some things that you should think about ahead of time. But as I as I thought through some of the things that I wish I had known, uh, some of those things came up in the early years of marriage, in you know year one through ten. And so I would say, if you're in that range, there's probably something in this book that would speak to you. Uh, Kay, honestly, was there a lot that you didn't know when you got married? <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it, do you remember? It's surprising how much I didn't know, but yes, I, I believe that's the case. Um, and you wish someone had sat down and told you these things. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I found, Jim, that even in talking to some of my married Christian friends, there were certain things that they held closely and didn't tell us. They didn't tell us how they were struggling financially. Years later, someone that I admired and respected told me about how she used to have to scrimp and save for grocery money. Well, I wish I had known that at the time, because when that happened to me, I thought there was something unusual or Charles and I were not managing well, and it's just struggling young couples trying to make ends meet. Did you make some mistakes at that time? Oh, made some huge mistakes. Mistakes, uh. huge mistakes, financial mistakes, credit cards. Oh, I wish I had known about <laughs> credit cards. I wish I'd known about compound interest <laughs> when I first got married. I'd be rich today if I had, had only known and practiced that principle. But uh, the, the, the list goes on, and, and we try to, we try to uh, uh, Charles and I, as we thought through these things for this book, tried to make it as comprehensive as we could. Finances is a big one, though. You know, uh, I made a lot of mistakes, too. Shirley and I both did, but that's not one of them in the financial area. And the reason is because I grew up in a college town, and I saw these young yeah. students uh, trying to live on love and having nothing and having orange crates for furniture. And when I was just a little kid, I looked at that and said, man, that doesn't work. I, I'm not going to do that. So uh, for one thing, we didn't get married till we were both out of college, and I was almost through my master's degree. And, and then I was very, uh, probably a stick in the mud, but I was very, very careful about spending money uh, on credit. Yeah. Especially we bought a, a, a television set, uh, $25 a month. We paid for that, and I thought I was in debt up to my ears. So I didn't make that mistake. Uh, I made a lot of others I'm probably not going to tell you about. But that, <laughs> Well, in our not... family, as I was growing up, I mean, we started out, as you know, very poor. And the thought that somebody would actually give you a credit card was incredible. Yeah. So I yeah. thought if they gave it to you, you should use it <laughs> <laughs> and as often as you could. But, let let uh, me tell you the mistake I did make. I, I made uh, a serious mistake. I was an only child. And I was the delight of both my mother and father. Uh, I had a very, very happy childhood, and, and I was the centerpiece for them. And uh, you can imagine uh, yeah. when I got married uh, that I was set up for certain <laughs> difficulties because that relationship had to change, and I didn't let it change fast enough. And there were times when Shirley felt kind of like a third wheel or something, yeah. you know, like she was uh, maybe grafted on or added on or something. And I could have done a whole lot more 
to help her with the mother-in-law situation oh, because yeah. Shirley and my mother loved each other, but there was this underlying tension there that went on for several years and never did break out into the open. It would have been better if it did. It was just there. You just hit on one that's in there <laughs> that I wish I had known uh-huh. about the special relationship between mothers and sons. Yeah. And what I remember very early on, it was about the second week of marriage, and Charles came down with a really bad strep throat, very ill, very sick. And his mom, in her very loving way, said, I tell you what, Kay, why don't you sleep out in the uh, in the living room on the pullout, and I'll sleep in the bedroom and get up all night with him, and I'll take care of him. And yeah. I said, what in the world? She said, well, I know you have to work, and I want you to get your rest, so I'll come over and I'll take care of Charles. And yeah. that, to me, was a real eye-opener. And unfortunately, yeah. I, I, I did the same thing Shirley did. I pushed it down and yeah. didn't deal with it and just was sort of angry and bitter about the special relationship that exists between mothers and sons and how we as wives need to navigate those waters Listen, and deal with those that's issues. that's a tough one. Boy, <laughs> that's is. a minefield for everybody <laughs> concerned, including the, the man, oh, I yeah. can tell you. Well, he's the <laughs> only one, incidentally, that I believe that can handle handle it and do yeah, something about it. Yeah. Well, you need to talk to him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, I wish that somebody could have talked to me cuz I easily could have uh, greased the skids oh. there. I could have made Shirley more comfortable. I could have let my mother know what the boundaries were. You know, well, I could Well, I think have done just that. as women if we just even understand the phenomena and now and now I am one. Yes. I am the mother of sons yeah. that want to fluff the pillows. Yeah. And, and so uh, I am very, very sensitive to that, uh, that relationship. You, uh, you begin this book with uh, dating relationships mm. and the engagement uh, and talked about uh, Mr. Wright and how you can know when you found him. Yeah. You're, you're basically talking to young women here. Well, you know, it's even a more narrow audience than that. It's young women, for sure, but young Christian women or women that come from the Judeo-Christian yeah. uh, ethic or background. And I think I, I really feel a need to say that because in the context of talking about the dating relationship, it came as an absolute surprise to me in the environment in which we live, that I would have to make a strong case for chastity mm. to Christian Isn't women. Isn't that amazing? And just in going around and talking about this book, I was interviewed by a young, perky, you know, absolutely darling, sweet Christian woman, young girl. And uh, as we talked about that and I raised that issue, I noticed she got a little teary-eyed. And when the interview finished, she said, well, I'm almost engaged. And I thought, oh, my gosh, no, you aren't. And Uh I came right out and asked her, and I said, are you engaged in premarital sex? Are you sleeping with that young man? And she said, yes, ma'am. And I have Uh been horrified. And so I really did feel a need to go back in and make the case for chastity to Christian young women. But I was shocked that I had to make a case for chastity yet again for God's women. But but we have to say it. We have to say it. Having grown up in a very different era, I am still shocked by it. And and horrified by it because it's not only an offense against God, but it is the worst thing, especially a woman can do. She's got far more to lose than the guy. He doesn't get pregnant. And most of the sexually transmitted diseases affect her more than him, including infertility problems and all kinds of things. Well, I make the case uh, as strongly as I know how. Uh, because I found a need to do that, um, and and I was surprised. Well, let's go back to this question. How do you know when you found Mr. Wright? Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not sure there's an easy answer for that. <laughs> um, I do believe that there are certain steps that you can and should go through. Uh, the one point that I do make is that there's a reason why they said love is blind, and, and, mm-hmm. and I really believe when you're in the middle of a love relationship, sometimes it is very difficult to see. And that's why God encourages us for uh, to seek the counsel of the mm-hmm. wise and, and to seek those who, who know you best. One of the things we said to Busy is that uh, it w- my, 
daughter, is that it was important for her to, number one, the person who knows her best, cares about her the most, loves her, and wants nothing but the best and the highest for her is her dad. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the young man understood there was to be no question and talk of marriage until he'd had a conversation with her father. So that was Mm -hmm. number one. Realize that's old fashioned, outdated. Realize that there are many women uh, who are who are not in a relationship with their father where they have that kind of trust. But for them, I say, seek out, you know, those individuals who know and love you best, seek their wisdom, seek their counsel and listen to what they have to say. Listen to your heart. If there's doubt. Oh, I cannot tell you the number of people who walk down the aisle with doubt and questions. On the other hand, if you don't feel a little anxiety about that decision, you don't understand the gravity <laughs> anxiety, of the whole thing. Anxiety, yes. Yeah. Doubt, doubt about no. whether it's right, no. Yeah. No. Well, you talk there about um, forever, understanding <laughs> what forever is. I thought that was outstanding, Kay. Oh, uh, it, Yeah. Explain what you mean about that word. Well, I didn't. I believed that marriage was forever. I was counseled that way before I got married. I knew that. But it wasn't until about year seven when we were in this relationship and it hit me that I'm mad at this man. He's laying next to me in bed, and I can't make him go away. <laughs> and, and that's when the concept of forever really sunk in, that forever really did mean forever. And my goodness, quite frankly, at that stage in our marriage, when that hit me, I was really down for a very long time because of all of the things that I understood were wrong in him or not right about our relationship. And it wasn't like I was going to get to start all over with with somebody else. This was it. And so at one level, I knew that it was forever. And on another level, it didn't sink in until about year six or seven. But I have to tell you uh, that while that was my struggle, one of my very dear friends that I let read the galley for this said, Kay, that's not where I was. For her, she got married believing that forever meant forever. And she was absolutely shocked and devastated when she found out it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so she had... Because he left? Yes. As a Christian woman, she had to deal with the fact that when she got married... She thought it was forever. She planned for it to be forever. She was a full-time homemaker, raising a family, not even a clue that one day her whole life could come crashing down around Mm -hmm. her. And so she had to deal with the fact that forever didn't mean forever. And for a, a huge percentage of Christian women, unfortunately, that's the reality. And so, you know, I don't know where... Individual listeners may be with that, but it is a struggle either way. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I would like to say something to every engaged couple, every couple that thinks they're in love, and probably they are. Uh, I would like to say something that I've never heard anyone say to those in that situation, uh, but I'm about to give them the best advice anybody's ever going to give them. I, I would like to tell them to take a look at that person that they're so in love with, that person that they can't even imagine a day without, that person who fills their entire world, that person that is a, a, a dream mm. come true for them. Take a look at that person and then understand that that person is shot full of flaws. Mm. It is the human condition. You're going to discover all kinds of flaws that you don't see right now. Things that irritate you, things that bother you, things that you wish were different, things that you may try to change. And he's going to look at you and see all kinds of inadequacies (laughs) and shortcomings because that's the human condition. That's who we are. And we deny that and discover them on the honeymoon. And all of a sudden you're, you're uh, claustrophobic because you can't get away from this person. Well, there are two things in there that I said, I wish I had known beforehand. One of which is, oh, and this one was a hard one. There's some things about him which are never going to change. Absolutely. 
And oh, my word, when that one hit me, I was devastated. <laughs> I thought I could read enough books, listen yeah. to enough tapes, highlight them and leave them on his side of the bed, pray enough, cry enough that that was going to change. Now, in God's infinite wisdom, I don't know why those annoying things will never change, but I have had to come to the conclusion that some of them will never. And you know what? Charles James deserves what all of us deserve, I believe, which is to be loved unconditionally, even Mm -hmm. with those things about him that will never, ever change. And the other thing I wish I had known, someone told Busy right before she got married, one of our dear friends, Carol Arnold, uh, we were having dinner together, and she looks at Busy and says, are there enough things that you all share in common, your goals, your aspirations, your faith, your politics, your, you know, all of that, and she went through that whole list, so that on any given day that you wake up and you look at him, and you just don't like him. Because a, that moment will come. Because that moment will come. And she said, you know what? That moment may last a few seconds, a few days, a few weeks. God forbid, but it could happen a few months. And in some marriages that I have known of, Jim, even mm-hmm. a few years. When that happens, is there enough that you have in common to keep you going through that time until you can rekindle and rebuild? And uh, I thought that was an interesting thing, and I didn't quite get it at the moment when she asked her that question. But when you share a common faith, when you share a common set of core values and beliefs, when you share a same vision about where you want to go in your life, when you go through those periods where, you know, those dry spells that inevitably come in a marriage, is there enough there that, uh, that you like that when you don't feel the love, it can keep you going. Is forever still forever under those circumstances? Forever is still forever then. Yeah. You can't get out just because you don't like them today. <laughs> yeah, you should not go into it no. under those circumstances. What do you tell uh, a young woman who is in a prolonged relationship with somebody she loves who will not commit to her? Leave him. <laughs> Kick him to the curb. <laughs> Get out of that relationship. Yeah. Uh, I, I I can think of dozens of, I told you, the name of the book is Keeping It Real. <laughs> I can think of many young women that I know of right now that are far too accessible, that are caring for these young men. You know, they cook for them. They they go over and clean their apartments, they, whatever they need. They edit their papers for work. And, you know, they, they it really is a, a setup. You know, I, I, I say the minute that you know that this is someone you want to spend the rest of your life with, this is what I say to guys, put a ring on a finger, get a date and make it happen. The minute that you know that this isn't the person, get out of the yeah, relationship. Yeah. But so many guys are being catered to and cared for. And, uh, and you know, it's a mother replacement mm. that they will stay in that relationship for years. And women wouldn't put up with that in the past. No. Certainly not to this degree. No, um, and I don't women think are women are so to... aggressive with ah. guys. So you and I were talking uh, at lunch yes. uh, a while back about uh, the women that call a guy over and over. They scare guys to death. Young men don't like to be pursued. They want to pursue. I mean, they may like it, but it's not healthy for the relationship. No, it isn't. And, uh, and you know, one of the most compelling reasons to break off that relationship is while you're spending time taking care of him, God may have someone else out there for you that you aren't available to meet because you're stuck in a relationship with a guy that won't commit. Leave him. Okay, you've flown a long way to be here oh. today. Let's uh, let's talk next time, can oh, we? Look forward to it. Uplifting words on this edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. You can learn more about Kay or her book, What I'd Wish I'd Known Before I Got Married, when you go to our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. Once you're there, you'll also find information about the various organizations that Kay is involved with as well. So after you get done listening to today's broadcast, go to drjamesdobson.org and click onto the Broadcast tab. 
We love being able to bring you classic and practical shows like the one you heard today. We want to encourage you and support you, too, through whatever stage of life that you are in, whether single, dating, married, parenting, even grandparenting. And the best way we can do so is through the Dobson Digital Library. Go to drjamesdobson.org to find the library's link at the top of the page. Once you're there, you'll be able to explore all of Dr. Dobson's articles and radio programs that pertain to parenting, marriage, culture, and faith. After perusing through the various resources, we urge you to create an account to save your favorite articles or programs to return to later or to easily share them with your friends and family. Finally, for those of you who have not yet heard, you can now listen to Family Talk's daily broadcast through Amazon Alexa. It's a simple and hands-free way to stay informed with Dr. Dobson's latest interviews. To learn how to get started with your device, visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for joining us today. Be sure to come back again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Dr. Dobson's discussion with Kay Coles James right here on Family Talk. Family Talk is not associated with Focus on the Family.